Welcome into the sanctuary of the City of Refuge Christian Church of Northwest Indiana. The Bible says in John 8.32 that you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So get your Bible and follow along as Pastor Pernal brings forth the words of life. I know life sometimes may present itself in a way where you don't think you're a winner, but you better tell your feelings and your thoughts and attitudes and everything that says you're not a winner and tell it to get out the way. In fact, don't just say get out the way, get the hell out the way. I'm a winner, amen? I'm a winner. I'm a winner. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above. And not beneath. See, I see. I, I mean, I, 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 you, 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 you don't know like I know. See, in 1984, I gave my life to the Lord. But, but see, I, I never knew that I would be in a place where I have a wife, three kids, and and grandkids, and have a master's degree, working on a PhD, and pastoring a church. Because see, I grew up drinking all my life, and when money was low, drinking that old Irish rose, that stuff tastes good, but it'll get you drunk. But it was cheap. In and out of clubs and drinking dope and sorting dope in my lungs and all that other kind of stuff. Gambling in the pool hall. I never knew what God would do in my life. But I want you to know today I'm a winner. When everybody else may have thought I was going to be a loser. Jesus says you are a winner. It's what Jesus says that you are. The world don't get to label you. Do you know your past experiences don't get to label you? The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. So I'm a winner. I don't care what the situation looks like. I'm a winner. Are you working with me? You Sometimes you got to encourage yourself in the Lord. Because nobody else is going to be around. Could be one o'clock in the morning and nobody gonna be there. Hey, I'm a winner. I'm healed in the name of Jesus. Gotta got go to Kimbrone in the morning. Ain't got time for going to the emergency room. I'm a winner. I'm healed because Jesus says I'm healed. Hallelujah. See, Jesus is good. If you don't have a hold of Jesus, you gotta get a hold of Jesus. You gotta get a hold of Jesus real fast. I, I said real fast. You know, Hebrews 10, 25, I'm a preacher to me, I'm still testifying. It said, forsake not the assembly of self together in like manner of some is. Hebrews 10, 25 says that right. But it says, so much more so as you see the day, what? Approaching. See, we can see the day approaching. That's why we got to gather. That's why we got to fellowship and encourage one another because the day is approaching. And I was telling them, I don't know, we didn't have church Wednesday. We prayed Wednesday at home, didn't we? But I was telling them last Sunday, see, it's not that you should pay attention to what's happening in Chicago and New York and Seattle or California that matters. You, it's, it's what's going on in Jerusalem. And when you see the nation of Israel going through what they're going through right now, so much, the soul, so much more as you see the day approaching. That's just telling you the day is approaching. You think that those people are going through some bad stuff now? Guess what? History repeats itself. Do you know that there were some more bikes? There were some people that went to the women, cut them open, pulled the babies out of their stomach, just being ruthless in Bible times. People have been ruthless from the beginning of time. This is nothing new. We're in the more perilous times that we've ever lived in. Paul says, Timothy, I know this, that in the last days they're going to be perilous what? Time. I'm looking at the news and there's an eight-year-old boy that got stabbed and killed. Perilous times. But I'm reminded of what General, General Smithley D. Butler said. He was a U.S. Marine. Any more Marines in here other than me? Yes! Who y'all? Who rise? Two of us in here. General Butler said the enemy is coming from the front. The enemy is coming from the rear. The enemy is coming from the left. The enemy is coming from the right. He can't get away from us this time. We got him. It's not that he's getting you. You got him. You got him in your sights. Are you working with me? Why? Because we're winners. We're warriors. We're conquerors. We're survivors. And you know how we're going to do it? Together. How are we going to do it? Together. 
If one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. I wonder what three can do. Hundred thousand? I wonder what four can do. See, sometimes people are looking for, I need a church full of people. Now give me four. Give me four. Give me four that wants to really get into the battle. But man, when we get 40, when we get 50, then you know the devil's in trouble. You understand what I'm saying? I was watching this bald head white guy yesterday. Deacon Jones sent me pictures. His name is Tom. Teaching little boys how to shoot crossbows. Was that a crossbow or, or just a regular bow and arrow? Compound bow. Teach them how to shoot compound bows. And I watched these little boys learning how to shoot. And I watched them paying attention to him very attentively. Just on the pictures, I saw it. They was watching him. Then I saw one little guy. He was straight to the farm. Shooting at the targets. But you know what Tom is doing one boy at a time? Keeping them out of games. Keeping them off drugs. Fulfilling void areas in their lives when there's an absentee dad. Or a dad that may be present but not spending time with his kid. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm watching us, one by one, change lives from young to old, to old. I said, Deacon, I'm baptized tomorrow. You think you're limited enough to jump in that pool? He said, I don't think so, Pastor. <laughs> but he sure keep this church clean. I can call him at night, hey, Deacon, I got to make this errand it's to a lady house, and I don't want to go by myself. Can you go with me? I can go, Pastor. From the young to the old, God is using us to change lives. An evangelist is a little older than 55, about 55 she may be. But do you want to know why? God can put her in an apartment that she may really don't qualify, but they can say, don't worry about it. It's because she's on the front lines of the battlefield several times during the week. Serving God and rebuking Tanya. <laughs> you... God take <laughs> so God take good care of you. So so we see all of these walls in our society are going down, but there is a group of people that's doing something about it. So let me pray, and we're gonna get into the word for a few minutes. Father, we thank you for this word. I don't know what to say, so I yield myself to you. God, let the words that come out of my mouth be ordained by you. Father, we didn't come today to rebuke the people. We didn't come today to correct the people. God, we come to exhort the people. We come to encourage the people today because you have an assignment that you've placed on every one of our lives. Whether we're walking in it yet or not, we all have assignments. And Lord, you come to encourage your people to walk in their assignments today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I'm not going to do any kind of review like we had done, but I will start at uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, uh, verse 6. Are you working with me? Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6 says, At last the wall was completed, half its height around the entire city, for the people uh, had worked with, in the New Living Translation, it says, enthusiasm. The message Bible says for Nehemiah 4, 6, we kept at it, repairing and rebuilding the wall while the whole wall was soon joined together halfway to its intended height because the people had a heart for the work. The Amplified Bible says, so we built the wall, the entire wall was joined together to half its height for the people had a what? 
heart to work. That means that these people that was going through opposition from the enemy, they was being talked about, they was being taunted, but while all of the haters was talking against them, they kept working. Do you do not let haters, do not let the devil set a bring in a spirit of spirit of discouragement into your life to cause you to lose your enthusiasm and your heart and your passion to do what God called you to do. You've got to understand that if God have called you to do something, the devil is going to do his job and make sure that he shoot an arrow called discouragement right in the center of your heart to get you to turn back from what God called you to do. But we have an example in this account where these People, although they was going through what they was going through, they kept working to complete the work that had begun because they had a passion and a heart to work. Church, don't ever lose your passion and your heart to do the work that God called you to do. I don't care if it's vacuuming the carpet. Don't lose a heart of passion. I don't care if it's ushering. Don't lose a heart of passion. I don't care if it's to teach little boys how to shoot a boat. Don't lose your heart. Don't lose your passion for what God called you to do. I don't care if it's singing, and Lord knows can this team sing. Don't lose your heart and your passion for what God called you to do. But you better know that there are taunting, tormenting spirits that want you to pull back from a coverage of what God called you to do. But when we look at the conditions of society, it should increase our zeal to work all the more, to push all the more, to complete the work. Are you working with me? And so while the enemy is, is tempting to put some level of discouragement uh, in your head, you keep on loving, you keep on working, you keep on carrying out the assignment that God has given you. Psalms 119, 139, we read this last week, it says, My zeal has completely consumed me because my enemies have forgotten thy word. The more the enemy of the psalmist that had written this psalm rejected the word of God, the more he was determined to be zealous for what? Those words. He would make sure that he honored the word of God, even if others didn't. You make sure you keep a passion, a zeal of your heart, in your heart to honor the word of God in every situation and every circumstance. You stand on the word. Brother Everett had put on Facebook a scripture that I had never paid attention to before, especially in that good news translation. And it said this. In the Good News Translation, if you correct conceited people, you will be insulted. You know, scorners, self-centered, prideful people, if you try to correct them, they're going to insult you. They don't want to hear it. But don't let that cause you to lose your passion and your heart for the Word of God. It says... If you reprimand evil people, you will only get hurt. And then verse 8 says, never correct conceited people. That's the Proverbs. Never correct. In other words, when you see a person and you know they're prideful, you know they're conceited, you leave them alone. Because they're not going to receive what you got to say. What happens to us is when we're trying to get the word through to people that's not open and they talk about you or they reject you, then a spirit of discouragement comes in and then you lose your hope and you lose your zeal and your desire to do what God called you to do because of the responses you get from people. And don't ever lose your, 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 your heart and your passion based on people's responses because everybody don't want the truth. And let me tell you something, church. We're living in a time where people don't like to give heed to sound doctrine. Are you working with me? I don't want to hear that. People are open to compromise. They're in the, I don't want to hear that mode. The psalmist says, never correct conceited people. They will hate you for it. But if you correct the wise, they will respect you. And see, we don't have a problem when we correct wise people. Say, oh, thank you so much for that. 
That keeps your passion, doesn't it? That make, keeps your heart. But even when you get those that reject, you still got to have. Don't let nothing or nobody or any situation set a spirit of discouragement into your life and cause you not to want to carry out your assigned task for your what? Life. Does, does, that, does that make sense? And so you, you, you got to understand that we're in this time where we, we've got to work uh, uh, to do. And last week I had read to you Isaiah 62, 1 through 7. But today I'm only going to read verse 6 and 7. It says, on your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed and stationed watchmen or prophets who will, keep, who will never keep silent. Never, said never keep silent. Never keep silent. Never keep silent. Every one of you can operate prophetically by speaking forth the word of God when you know thus said the Lord about a situation. Speak it forth. Never keep silent. Day or night, you who profess the Lord, take no rest for yourselves. What does that mean? Don't go to sleep? Does that mean, man, do I just never take a break? No, it means don't you ever stop praying. Don't you ever stop standing in the gap because other people's lives are depending on it. Are you understanding me what I'm saying? Other people's lives are depending on it. Don't take no rest from prayer. Don't go on vacation from prayer. If you go on a cruise, pray. Be watchful. If you go to Las Vegas, pray. Be watchful. Wherever you go, don't ever take a break from being watchful in your prayer and being diligent because other people's lives are depending on it. You're safe. You're okay, but what about them? And verse 7 says, and give him no rest from your prayers. Give him no rest. Who? Give God no prayer. Give God no rest. Every time God's turned around, he should hear you praying. Give God no rest from your prayer. Always pray. Amen. Let's always pray without ceasing. Always pray. Church, we're in a time where we need prayer. Do you know you can hardly, well, I don't know because I don't go to a whole lot of places. But there's not a lot of places as far as I know where you go and you're just seeing devils cast out too much anymore. We're in comfortable church. We're in seeker friendly church. Let's have a little coffee in the lobby. You know, last Sunday we had devils cast out of here. I talked to one of the individuals and said, what happened to you? I don't know. It felt like something left my body. Yeah, we know what the something was that left the body. It was demonic influence. We have to constantly pray. What? And I'm not talking about that movie stuff where you see the Catholic priest with that cross and holy water and the devil sitting back laughing, or the witch sitting back laughing at the priest. Oh, you know, I'm not going to. No, I'm not talking about that fake. I'm talking about the power of God that comes through prayer, which truly can see everything that we call mental illness today. Behind some of that mental illness is demonic influence. And you get rid of demonic influence by getting the word of God and prayer. Are y'all understand what I'm saying? Sarah Quill can't cast out demons. How dog can't cast out demons. But the name in the name of Jesus. Are y'all working with me? Well, who can do that? All of us. If you got Jesus in you, got the Holy Spirit in you, you can be a prayer warrior, prayer warrior, and you can. You can minister to people and people will be set free by the power. That's what people need to be. What? Set free. Are, are you working with me? Y'all done got quiet on me. But Isaiah 62, 6, the New Living Translation says, O Jerusalem, I have posted a watchman on your walls. They will pray day and night continually. Take no rest. All you who pray to the Lord, pray continually. So can we go back to Nehemiah 4 and 6 real quick and get back to what we want to talk about today because all of that was what? Introduction. It says in Nehemiah 4 and 6, for the people had work with enthusiasm or the people had a heart to what? Work. The people. It didn't just say Nehemiah. 
It said the people had. It didn't say Nehemiah had. Nehemiah was the leader, but the scripture says the people under Nehemiah's leadership had a what? A heart and a passion to what? Work. You know what I'm pulling out of this passage is a word called cooperation. Nehemiah was the leader, but he had cooperation from the people to restore the gates and the walls to the city so that the city can be protected. Do you know what the word cooperation means? Is that every one of you under the sound of my voice have a mandate on your life to submit yourself to a man or woman of God somewhere and help complete the wall in your community to bring resolve to some of the stuff that is not godly. Every one of us have a mandate on our life. Every one of us must sit, submit to a spirit of cooperation that says, here I am. What do you need help with? I want to help rebuild what? The wall. And your help may not look like everybody else's help, but make sure you're helping. Does, does, does that make sense? And so I wanted to go to a couple of scriptures. Would you turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6, Minister Overby ministered this, came from this portion of scripture a few Wednesdays back. Um, but I wanted to go back and revisit this and to take a look at the context of cooperation. Because the sons of the prophet had came to the man of God, and this is what happened in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. Are you there? It says, one day, the group of the prophets came to Elisha and told him, as you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Oh, that almost reminded me of here. <laughs> that almost reminded me of here. I, I, we do have a blueprint, but, but that reminds me of here. It says, let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we." What's it say? Say we. We. That pronoun we. I know there's different pronouns. I, you, he, she, it, we, they. But this pronoun is we. It's me and you, Adrian. We. We. It's a we. It's an inclusive word. It's, it's us. It's a us thing. There we can build a new place for us to what? Me. And so you, when you come here, and you see this, you wouldn't say, wow, look at pastor's vision. Let's watch him go. No, it's look at our vision and let us do what we got to do to get a bigger place. I, I, I'm just, you know, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Where they were, were was too what? Small. And they said, let us go and do this. There we can build what? A new place for who? Us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. Please, but, 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 but look at this. The sons of the prophet said to the man of God, please come with us, someone suggested. So Elijah could have said, nah, I'm going to go and seeking and, and, and the face of God and I'm going to um, I'll be here. You guys go ahead and let me know when it's done. He said, all right, he told them. Go ahead. Please come with us in verse 3. Someone suggests. And look what Elijah said. I will, he said. I'll go with you. Elijah represented the, the mouthpiece of God. The, 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 the presence of God. And so while they was working, they was working in the presence of God. They was all doing this thing, what? Together. Elisha wasn't God, but what did he represent? The presence, the word of God. The power of God. I will, he said. So he went with them. And when they, look at that another pronoun. When they arrived at the Jordan. They go another pronoun. They begin cutting down trees. You keep seeing these pronouns? They and the days. 
I don't see no he or him. I see they. It's cooperation. Right? It's, it's, it's cooperation. Let me get to my verse again. And so they and they begin to cut down trees. Verse 5 says, but as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe head fell into the river. He said, oh no, sir, he cried. And the key to this verse is here. It was borrowed. Now, if it had been his axe head and he wasn't beholden to somebody at the end of that event, I'll just get you another axe. But this one was borrowed. This one he had to post to take back to somebody. Do you know when you borrow something, you're supposed to give it back? I know this is 2023, but do you know if you borrow something, you're supposed to give it back? Do you know if you go to somebody and say, man, I borrow $5, you're supposed to get the $5 back. People should have to hunt you down. Where my $5? <laughs> you, where my money at? And if you loan somebody over $1,000, don't expect it back. And so my wife now, if somebody said, Pastor, get out of my she said, no, nah, don't give it unless you don't want to see it. No, don't, don't give it out unless you don't want to see it no more. That's what she always tell me now. If you don't want to see it no more, don't give it out. You know why? Because people don't under the, what the, 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 the covenant, the word borrow means. You said you could give me is one thing. Borrow is totally different. So if you know you don't want to pay it back, say, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not going to give this back to you, but I need it. Can I have it? That's good communication. Is that practical Christianity? But if you say borrow, that means give it back. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Let's pray for him, Lord. Pray. Pray. But it was, it was a borrowed axe. Do you see that? So verse 6 says, where did it fall? He went to the man of God. Where did it fall? The man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elijah simply went and cut a stick and threw it into water at that spot. Then the axe head, metal, floated to the surface. When do you ever see metal floating? Not like an axe head. You may see a ship floating, but it's got this buoyancy and all these laws to create it to float. But not just an axe head itself. So you got the workers and you got the power of God. And so you got the worker going to the man of God and said, hey, and the man of God threw the stick in there, grabbed it, Elisha said, and the man reached out and he grabbed it so that when he finished the work, he can go and be good on his word. But it took what? Cooperation. It takes all of us to make a thing work what? Well. Now, I watched the Rams, and they fucking this year. But you, you got it, 11 people on offense. You got 11 people on defense. And they all supposed to cooperate. The offense is supposed to cooperate together to get the, the ball into the end zone to score. Everybody on that offensive team has a purpose. The center gives it to the quarterback. The guard, they block. The tackles, they block. The tight end runs for the pass or block. There's a back that runs or block. They all have their responsibilities, and as the team is going to win, they all have to cooperate properly together to be successful. And if you want to know how true that is, all you got to do is ask the quarterback for the Denver Broncos. What's his name right now? What's his? Russell Wilson. When Russell Wilson was with Seattle and they had a good front and they had a, they had a good line and everybody was cooperating and they had a coach that knew how to call the plays, Russell Wilson looked like a superstar. You take him to Denver where it's a different coach Different people not carrying their assignments. Russia Wilson looks like Buddy. No one person, no one person can get it done. As great as Michael Jordan was, he had Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman. He had, what, 
Horace Grant. He had Bill Cartwright. He had, what's the coach of the Lakers? I mean, of Golden State. He had Phil Jackson as the coach. Steve Kerr. He had, he had a supporting cast. And when they, they, and when they put Dennis Rodman on that team, they just wanted him to create chaos. You get rebounds. Hit people. <laughs> he did a good job. You do this job. And with cooperation, it made what? Them what? Successful. Do you know that church is no different? When we're all connected and we're following the rules of the coach, it has the plays in the book, you know that more souls will be saved, more people will be discipled, more kids will be off the street, more devils will be cast out, People deliver from drugs, all these other kind of things. Why? Because we're all working together. You know what I did Wednesday night? I called time out. I called time out as the coach. Because I had him in the hospital. I had him that had been here all day. I had her been here all day. He was going to stay here all day. He was going to stay here all day until after church. I said, uh huh, I got something for you. I sent a message out. Church is canceled. Because I needed to rest my team. Because I needed them to go farther. Because when you go downstairs and you look at the floors and the wall, they was all painted by one person. When you look at all of the stuff that was moved, they was moved by one person. And that one person was going to have to stay in the game and work overtime to stay here all night Wednesday. So as a smart coach, says, time out. We won't play tonight because I needed to rest my team. Have you ever seen a coach run his team to death? They all tied. He won't call time out. You call time out to rest your team. It's called cooperation. Because sometimes when the team don't win, it's coach's fault. Because coach is like he ain't got no sense. Don't you see your team breaking apart? <laughs> you need to change players. You see a team break, you, you make substitutions. But it's all in the coach's plan. Because the ultimate goal is for all of us to what? Win. That was in no way trying to indict it was to paint a picture of the process are you working that that's not the, that was not an indictment that was not a shame on you if you wasn't here it was a clear picture of how this thing works i've been saved a long time since 1984 and have not backslidden and i've seen a lot of mistakes made in the church and one of the mistakes i see is the coaches pastors we overwork and abuse our people and you have people serving madly instead of gladly I'm never going to do my people like that. Take care, y'all. I need you. It took me having to take six Vicodin and say, I need you. Because that's, that's not in my nature. Like some of you all have the problem. You're struggling, but you won't say, I need you. I almost got to be housed, but I need you. You know, you know, I don't got high on something. But God is changing me. He's changing me. He said, I need you, brother, brother Reddy. I need you, Mama Alice. I need you. You need me. We need each other. But some of you sitting here right now, you're struggling. You need us, but you won't tell us. What if you would just say, I need you? We can make your load easier. We may even can make the axe head float. <laughs> you, you, you understand what I'm saying? Do you know if Vengeance hadn't, hadn't have called me, she would have missed the boat? Because she was frustrated. Thinking wasn't as clear. Pastor, I need information. Let's make this axe head float. You over there working at Kimbo, dealing with Tanya? Look, you need a You need break. You need a break. 
<laughs> another, <laughs> another example that I want to give you is from Exodus 17. Is this making sense? Are y'all ready for me to stop? I'll stop because y'all didn't say no. I'll stop after Exodus 17. I, I'm going to stop. I'm going to read this whole chapter too. Can I read the whole chapter? Do you know what liberates people is the word of God, not my opinions? Right? And so if my football player, man, I just pray you, would you please not forget us when you become successful in life? Just don't forget us. That's all I'm saying. Remember, just pay your tithe to the city of refuge, okay? Please, to the city of refuge. Send your tax, brother. We won't have to take another offering. Um, but let's, <laughs> let's read the entire chapter of Exodus. Can we do this? We're talking about cooperation, right? And we're also talking about leadership, right? And I need for you leaders to understand that leadership is not always going to be easy. Okay? Leadership is not always easy. It's a process. It takes a certain mindset to be an effective leader. Are you understand what I'm saying? And so, Brother Tom, as we get into Exodus 17 on your job, the at the low <laughs> You working with me, Tom? Okay. All right. Okay, Tom. Listen carefully. All right. At the Lord's command, the whole community, the whole, the whole community left Israel uh, the wilderness of sin, right? And moved from place to place. Eventually they kept that Riphidim, but there was no water there for the people to drink. So verse 2 says, so once more, this, this, once more, in other words, these people, they have complained before. In leadership, you got to realize that there's always going to be some complaining coming from somewhere. Whether you're in your job, on your job, whether you're in church, it, whether you have a family meeting in your house, it doesn't matter. There's always going to be somebody that's going to be um, messed up in their head and have a problem with something. Are y'all working with me? So don't just think church, but <clears throat> right? So once more, the people complain against Moses. Give us water to drink. They, they demand it. Quiet, Moses replied. Quiet. I can't take it no more. <laughs> and that's important because I've seen in church, since we're in church, I'm talking about church, I've seen pastors preach mad. And nobody want to come and listen to a mad pastor. Because all they do is fuss from the poor pit because they're frustrated. So Moses frustrated, quiet, I can't take it, Tony, leave me alone. Moses replied, just said, why do you keep picking on Tanya? Because she needs my love and care and attention. <laughs> quiet, Moses replied, why are you complaining against me? You see what Moses said? Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord? But tormented by thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children, our livestock with thirst? And the God then brought them out abundant. He provided for them. He, he all the way. I mean, God them been good. But at the first little time where their flesh is not being satisfied complaints are coming out of their mouth do you see this 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 in every aspect of your life on your own okay, why what we did better over there why we got to move now then moses cried out to the lord what should i do with these people they are ready to stone me the lord said to moses Walk out in front of the people. Take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile, and call some of the elders of Israel to join you. And I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Am I in the right place? Yes, Strike the rock, and the water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. 
So Moses struck the rock as he was told. The water gushed out as the elders what? Looked on. Moses named the place Masa, which means test. It was a testing place. You've got to understand that in leadership, all levels of leadership, you're going to go through some tests. Saints that's following, you got to understand in this journey, you're going to go through some tests. And it's important that you go through these tests correctly. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And they call the place Mariba or Mariba, which means arguing. Because the people of Israel argued with Moses and tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord here with us? Or not. That's what you have to go through as a leader. But you got to understand that you have to continually look toward the Lord and allow the Lord to comfort you and strengthen you. And you have to allow what we call a spirit of meekness to rise up in you as a leader so that you don't throw or go off on the people. You don't let it stick. Because with the moment you let it stick, you're going to say something or you're going to do something that's going to disqualify you. Because <laughs> God's work is going to get done, but you're going to be disqualified because you as a leader that said something or done something that you shouldn't have said or done. That's the leadership class. I, I told you today it's not rebuke, it's, it's exhortation, right? Right? And so now that they get to the process, we find the next part of this chapter. Y'all still with me? I know my sister with me because I'm getting a smile out of her every once in a while. You with me, girl? I know you with me, girl. I got you covered. It says, so Josh, so, so while the people of Israel were still in Rephidim, the warriors of Amalek, Amalek, uh, Am, Am, Amalek attacked them. Because the enemy just never, he never sleeps a slumber, does he? He always coming, right? So you always got to be ready. So Moses commanded Joshua. Choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. You go and choose some men. Okay, you're going to go get Felix. You're going to go get Reggie. You're going to go get um, uh, uh, Deacon Ship. You're going to get Deacon Jones. You're going to go choose these men to go out and what? Fight for what? Us. Right? And tomorrow, I will stand at the top of the hill. Holding the staff of God, what? In my hand. I may stop right there today. So you got Moses saying, you go get the men. You guys fight. I will pray. We all at this point don't need to be on the battlefield. We need something that represents a consistent um, intercession on your behalf while you do what you do. Right? That's why, in, as leaders, it's very important because some of you are members of somebody else's church. You preserve and protect your pastor so he can do what he's called to do, which is to pray and stay in the presence of God for you as you do what? The work. Are you working with me? And you go do the work. I will go hold the staff. That staff meant something. Because they seen that same staff when they crossed the Red Sea. They seen that same staff that when they came out of Egypt, that was the same staff that turned into a serpent. Where his staff, his serpent, ate their two serpents. It was that same staff that was utilized to defeat all of the gods of Egypt. Every one of those plagues represented gods of Egypt. It was that same staff. So they saw that God really moved, God's presence was manifested as Moses occupied this instrument that they could see. It was more about something that could appeal to what they could see or relate to. So when these guys would go to battle and they see Moses they're praying, holding the staff. They say, oh, we're going to get them now. I see the man of God and I see the staff. And so the same God that delivered across the cross the Red Sea, the same God that delivered us from Egypt, the same God will water gushed out. If he's holding that staff, hot digging it though, let's go get him. It takes cooperation. 
You understand what I'm saying? If they saw that the man of God was in place, but there was times that the man of God, while he was doing that battle, was getting tired. And when Moses would let down his arms, they would begin to lose why they didn't see the motivating factor. So he had two boys. He had Aaron and he had Ur. When they heap his hands up, cooperation, they will win. Don't ever leave your brothers and sisters arm down. There should always be somebody there to hold your arms. We all need some. Every one of us needs somebody to hold our arms up because this thing can get tiring. This thing can cause you to make you want to quit. It can make you want to do nothing. But I need my brothers and sisters to hold our, each other's arms up. Are you understand what I'm saying? And with that place of cooperation, there's victory. We need each other. None of us is an island. I can't believe I'm saying that. I told Misha, I was talking to Misha the other day, I said, I got two lawnmowers, and if one breaks down, I don't have to ask nobody to use theirs. I just get the other lawnmower. Is that true? Went and bought a freezer last night. I go unload it by myself. I called my wife. She said, oh, this is heavy. I said, no, we got it. We, we, got call no, we need to go get no neighbor. We can do it. How much easier would it have been if I'd have went to my neighbor, which wouldn't have mind helping? Come on, Robert Wilson. And Robert Wilson, I'm closing now because I, I want to keep, I want y'all to come back again. Robert Wilson actually, actually asked me for water. He did. He don't ask people for nothing. He laid up in the hospital. He said, I said, anything I can do for you? Some people say that just to be nice, right? Can I be? So I said, is there anything I can do for you? He says, yeah, I really would like a prepared water. I'm imported. He's in the hospital in Munster. And there was a ram in the bush. My daughter was at work that night. So I reached out to Roz. She was working in the ER. I said, Rob, Deacon needs water. She said, well, I'm in the ER. I really don't supposed to leave. I said, well, send one of your coworkers. But whatever you got to do, this man done asked for something. We got to do it. <laughs> and so she took off. She said, I got to go take care of my uncle. She took off to that hospital until she found a propel, and she got the water to the man. That seems small to hold. But that's huge. Because when people normally don't ask you for something and then they finally do and you don't deliver. I ain't going to ask no more. I may have to ask you again. I don't care if it's water or help me tie my shoe. We got to be there for each other. At all. So she went to she FaceTime. I got to see him laying up there smiling with that hair. Because we work together. And if we stay together, there's absolutely nothing that we can't do together to rebuild the gates and the walls to our communities. Because we got it together. But we need each other to help people out there. See, think beyond us, because we together, I hope and I pray. And if you not let us know, let us help you get together. So, Father, I thank you today for your word and the journey that you're taking us on. And, Lord, each and every one of us can see problems in the community of which we live. But, God, we want to be the solution to those problems. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be a part of the body of Christ. And God, you do your work through us. Axe head flow. 
bring water out of an unsuspecting source like a rock. God, you use us as intercessors and warriors to defeat the enemies that's coming against us. And Father, we know that we're at our best when we're all firing like well put together spark plugs to keep the engine going. We need each other. And Father, I just pray supernaturally by your spirit that you're binding us closer and closer. And that, God, you're increasing our dependence upon you and each other as never before. Knowing that if we can stand together, your purposes will be established in the earth. Lord, we know in order to be a part of the body of Christ, we must be saved. We must have Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior. That's the, that's the way in. We can't just join this family. We have to be born into this family. And if you're here today with eyes closed and heads bowed, if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and personal Savior, if you're not sure if heaven would be your home if Jesus was to come in the next moment and all the signs are out there that he's coming. You're not sure, but you want to be sure. And you're not necessarily joining this church, but you are accepting Jesus into your life for the wages of sin is death, spiritual separation from God for eternity, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way that you can get to the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way. And you want to accept Jesus in your life, just raise your hand. You ain't got to come down here. We just pray with you right where you are. I see your hand, ma'am. Anybody else? You here? You know you need Jesus. I see your hand. Anybody else? I, you, 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 you need Jesus. I see your hand, ma'am. I see your hand. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Anybody else? You've never asked Jesus to come into your life. You want to do that today. And so, saints, the rest of us, as we keep our eyes closed, you all can put your hands down. The Lord see you and I see you. We're going to pray with you right now. Just join in as cooperation as a family. Say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I want to be saved. I want Jesus as Lord of my life. I believe that Jesus came. Jesus lived, Jesus died, he was buried, and rose again. He did all of that for me. So right now, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and help me to serve you the rest of the days of my life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want you to know that if you prayed that prayer, every sin that you've ever committed in your life has been forgiven. You may not feel any different, but it's by faith. Every wrong that you've ever done has been covered by the blood. And your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because when we stand before God, he's going to look to see if your name is there. And if his name is there, you in. Amen? You may not be the most perfect. You may not have done everything right, but your name is there. It's called grace. And today we want to welcome you into the family of God. I want to encourage each and every one of you to get a hunger and a thirst for the word. Subscribe to our discipleship classes that we have. Amen? Grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that God will explode in you and your life will never, ever, 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 ever be what? The same. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Give God a whole another hand praise for that. As we tithe and give offerings. We are believing God for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and good surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, Blessing and increase, 
Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give to the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Just like some of you have testimonies, I got a piece of mail in the picture. I think it came just last week. It says you have a piece of 